quiet. That is completely intentional. Do not panic. Do not panic. Um, okay, right, folks. What we are going to do now is um, I'm going to go back to that one, I think. Yes, that one. Um, and th so this is a second look at the rail driver. So what we are going to so so a while back we did the um a, a look at the rail driver a sort of a very first initial look at the rail driver and uh, a number of questions came out of um how you get the best out of it how you do more with it so um what i wanted to do is to come back to the rail driver so there are in a couple of um simpler uh questions that i'm going to address first uh, but then people have also asked me to look at some of the more complex topics. Now I'm going to warn you, this involves programming. Um, relatively simple programming, but programming nevertheless. If this flies over your head, then I'm going to apologize in advance and say that I am keeping it to a minimum, just to demonstrate the concept. And so that for those that know a little bit about programming, and you don't really need to know, to know much, um, then you need... <laughs> <laughs> just looking at the chat, uh, then you'll learn something. If you don't know anything, then feel good that other people are hopefully learning something, and then uh, hopefully they'll do stuff that you can learn from or you can uh, you can benefit from. What I want to, what I would ideally like, is to see some of the more technically inclined people in the community actually taking up the mantle on this and uh, f trying to work, perhaps with PI engineering, on um, ways to actually advance and extend what PI have done. Um, and uh, make it you know, sh demonstrate how you can change which lever you want to use or how you make it compatible with different locos. So let me give you a quick outline of what we're going to cover first. So first thing we're going to do is uh, how do you cope with TS, a train simulator, being installed in different locations to where it normally installs. So by default it's in C, program files, um, Steam, Steam apps, common, railworks and then the rail driver DLLs in plugins. Uh, the next, uh, the it's, if you've got it on the D drive or you've got it somewhere else, then of course that's going to cause a problem and the script needs to be told that. There are instructions on the PI Engineering website that tell you how to do this, but I wanted to um, actually show you it. So we do that first. Second, um, just go back through remapping the blue buttons uh, using Macroworks, which is the software that comes for rail work, uh, the rail driver. Uh, that will be quite straightforward. Um, then I'm also going to show you that um, you can... Uh, so I demonstrated the uh, the tablet. The tablet? I think I'm talking rubbish at this point. Um, so I demonstrated the, uh, the... Let me bring up the console camera. Right, now let me make that a bit bigger so that you can see... This is the rail driver here on the bottom of the screen. So, um, so you can see the rail driver. These blue things here are the buttons I'm going to show you how to reprogram. And then, um, so you can take this lid off. I'm going to do that later on. And then you can put new. You see this white, this white uh, line here. That you can put bits of paper in there. And so the templates you can get for that are actually available on PI Engineering's website. So I'm going to show you how to do that. That's pretty much the easy topics. Then it starts to get a little bit more tricky. So topic number four: remapping it so that it uses the loco brake lever. This one as the throttle handle. Yeah, I'm not going to show you the best way of doing it, I'm going to show you a quick and easy way of doing it. Um, and then uh, the programmers amongst you can figure out about a better way. Adding notches to levers. So some locos actually require that um, you have the rail, the uh, various controls at specific values. So 25%, 50%, otherwise they don't do anything at all. Now if you've got this control and you're moving this gently up and down, what you'll find is that you'll never hit exactly 25%. And so what you need to do is then apply notches. So again, it's not massively complicated, but it does require scripting. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to do is apply some of that knowledge and we're going to try and make the UV class 150 work a bit better. So the uh, the UV 150, there's a, it basically works, but there's things like the brakes don't work, for example, because it needs the notching. The, the reverser ideally needs the notching uh, and so forth. And uh, there's other things that you could do, like headlights, which I'm not going to cover in this stream, just because I realised how I needed to do and I needed a... Uh, um, I needed more time to get that sorted, so I'm not going to worry about that. Besides, that's headlines. It's it's not the uh, the ideal way. Um, so um, let me start at the beginning. The first three topics are the relatively easy ones, uh, and we'll get those done first. So let me switch that off. Um, 
So coping with trains in being installed to different locations to the default. Now the instructions um, basically describe, uh, they ask you to do different things whether you have run the rail driver before or whether you have not run it before. I'm going to take a slightly different tack and actually say always do one step and then optionally you, you do the other step if you need to. So let's do the first step which is the, um, so what you need, what what we're trying to do is to tell the rail driver script where your dear, your installation of train sim is. Let me fire up um, MacroWorks when it fires up. Anytime you like. Oh, no, that's it. It's pulled down the bottom here. There you go. So MacroWorks. So it's fired up. It's looking at the X keys. Right, this is the rail driver one. So in here. Um, what you can do is um, you've got this thing called a script so let me just show you what we're looking at so under script code under window um, you go in here and you've got the script this is the dirty script this is the script the programmy stuff we're going to be looking at apologies not dirty script but um, this is the uh, the script we're going to be looking at and somewhere down in here you'll see this thing called DLL paths Right, now this is not where we're going to edit it, we're going to do it somewhere else, but I just want to show you what we're ending up at, is we're trying to find these bits here, this is where it says, is it in C program files or C program files x86, so this will pick it up in the default location. So let's just exit that, and we'll exit MacroWorks, and what we'll do instead is we'll go and have a look um, at, the, uh, at the right place. Now the, uh, the first place to look is where you have installed the software. So that is here. On my system, it is in D, Program Files x86, PI Engineering, MacroWorks 3.1, Devices, Rail Driver. Now that path is actually given on the uh, on the PI Engineering website. So I'm basically just repeating much of what's already on the website. So if you're having any uh, confusions, then default to refer referring to their instructions. Uh, those are the tried and tested. Um, so, and mine, I've got it on the D drive. You've probably got it on the C drive. Otherwise than that, this should be the default location. Now, under here, you'll find a script 210 template.mw3. So, what we're going to do is I'm going to open it, and uh, now I'm using Notepad. You can open it in just regular old Notepad. And then somewhere down here, you scroll down, you'll find that DLL paths. Right, and this thing called public sub initialize. Don't worry about what that means for the time being. We're just keeping it simple. And then this is the uh, the path to your rail work. So let's say, for example, you have set up the same path and it's on the D drive. Well, you could just change the C to a D. Right, wherever your Railworks plugins folder is, this is where you need to point to on here. So if you have any um, if I can make that bigger, I can make that bigger. There you go. Look, is that easier to read? Um, so look for DLL paths, a string, and then change the C to a D or to whatever you want it to be. Now I'm going to leave mine as C because it's actually mine's in all in the right place. So um, that's the first change you need to make. Uh, and what that does is it edits the um, the basic um, the the source configuration. So essentially so that you can be free to mess about with the scripts in any way you want what they do is they have a template which you then create an instance of and then you mess with the template and that's why there's two things and they say have you used it or not if you haven't used it you will then they say edit this one I'm saying edit this one anyway because that way if you do um, um, a, a file new later on it will recopy it back over and you'll have to re-edit it anyway so you might as well just change this one right this is the first change that you need to make and then save that file out. The second change you need to make is only if you have actually used RailDriver before. So if I just go to the user folder, this is in C users, your username, app data, local, PI engineering, MacroWorks 3, my scripts, RailDriver. Quite a long path. Underneath there, you'll find these these files, and one of them is script two ten underscore two ten dot mw three. If you open that, oh sorry, if you don't have that file, don't worry. If you do have that file, open it same way. You're looking for exactly the same thing. I'm just scrolling down, and we find it. There it is. 
DLL paths and we've got exactly the same entry in there so you just have to basically make exactly the same change at this point in the file uh, and then save that out. So that is how you fix RailDriver so that it will talk to a different install location for um, your train simulator. If you put PI Engineering's MacroWorks software somewhere else doesn't matter at all. If you've got train sim in a different location and you can do that by creating new libraries in Steam and then copying the stuff over there then that's what you need to do. Um, Rob says, can you make it so if used on two different drives you don't need to keep changing scripts? Uh, you kind of have to because it depends which DLL you're using I think whether in it's actually going to work or not I don't know you might be able to just put multiple paths in there so if you look in the uh, in this um, you'll notice that there are actually two paths in here there's nothing to stop you adding a third or a fourth or a fifth and do what you like in there so um, if you um, come in here and add an add additional ones it will basically use the first one it finds it doesn't know which one is the one that you're actually running the game in which may still work I don't know um, so I would suggest that you try it but be, be prepared for it not to work. Okay, right. So that's edited the script. So that's topic one. Um, so edit the file. So edit the core file. Thank you very much, Northern Ralph, for her birthday wishes. Uh, edit the uh, the core file, which is where you installed um, the um, the rail driver software, and then edit the user file if you've got one, which again is in you see users, your username, app data, local. PI Engineering, MacroWorks 3, MyScript, RailDriver, so it's all in there. Again, this is all outlined on the PI Engineering website. Let me just bring that website up so that you can see it. Uh, and then we, can, uh, then we can move on to the next topic. So in here... Uh, it says, uh, if, Mac, if it, can't, says it can't find um, 3.1, then under Windows XP, follow these instructions under Windows Vista and 7.8, uh, 7 and 8 and 8.1, follow those instructions. So essentially that's what I've just shown you. Um, so uh, between what I've just shown you and these instructions, you should be in good, good shape for uh, getting that bit working. Okay, what's next? What did I say was next? Remapping the blue button keys. Right, this requires the MacroWorks software again. So let's bring MacroWorks up. It lives on your system tray. Get out of your way. So we switch that to Rail Driver. If you haven't got anything else, it will just always default to Rail Driver. You don't need to worry about that. Um, so in here, if I want to remap one of these buttons, so any of these ones that have got ticks on them, or in this case, not got a tick because nothing's mapped on it, you just double click it. All right, so if I double click that button, I can say, right, now what do I want it to do when I press that? Let's say, for example, I want this button to do the horn, just because, because, like, spacebar. So what we could do is, um, if you press this button, automatic separation uh, of up and down keystrokes, then it makes life a lot easier. If what you want to do is simulate simply pressing a button and releasing it. So what we do now is, I want to say, press the spacebar. So what happened there, when I pressed the spacebar and released it, is it said that when the button is pressed, so press macro event, then we will do um, space and then the down arrow. Release, we do space and then the up arrow. Uh, that's basically um, it. So that sets that. If we now hit save, something went wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, nice. I don't quite know what I've got wrong there, but never mind. Nothing ever goes smoothly, does it? That's the principle. It will work for you. As usual, I've messed about with my system. What I'm going to do, actually, is under here, if you click New, so if you've ever messed about with a script, you may well find that it no longer works using this stuff, and you're going to have to then stay in the script. So if you're not a programmer, I would recommend leaving the script alone. Uh, click File New, and it'll say, Loading a new script will remove all macros in the script. Click Yes. What it does is it reverts everything back to default. Yeah, so if you ever make any mistake in the script or anything doesn't work, click File New and you're done. Um, so if we double click on this again and automatic separation, press the space bar and save. There you go. So this time it's worked. So that's because I've been messing about with the, uh, with the script file that this user interface then uh, doesn't really like me anymore. <laughs> um, Rightcar says, now that macro works with the new updates, would you recommend using it or keep it or keeping writing your own software? Uh, to be honest, I'd just use the macro software. It does the job very nicely. 
Um, you may want to customize it to do uh, to do things that you want, but you'll be a much uh, you'll get a bigger head start using what's been provided than starting again from scratch. Uh, you can do the same thing on the horn. So you'll notice there's actually two little white boxes here: whistle up and whistle down. So if you double click on whistle up, you can say at the moment it's doing space bar, and if I uh, double click on whistle down, you can see you know, it's actually also doing the space bar. So let's make that do the B key. I don't want it to do that. So let's delete everything, um, and we will go back to text, uh, sorry, keystrokes, and we'll say B. So now when I press the B, key, uh, press the horn down, it's actually going to press the B key. So let's save that out. So that's got spacebar and the B bar in B key, and that's uh, and that's it. So I'm just having a look at the chat, see whether or not I've got any more questions I'm missing out. If there's anything you want me to ask, then please make sure you put at and my name in there so that it shows up green, because uh, there's a lot of chat flying by and I'm. Uh, uh, and I'm missing it because I'm not reading it, I'm busy talking. So, this is how you can remap all of these blue buttons, and even these ones over here, pad up, down, right, left, the rocker up and down, you can remap all of this stuff um, to do other things, they default to just the arrow keys. Uh, these ones over here are actually a little bit more complicated, they press the right control key and the up key, and then they release the, right, the up key and the control key, so that's what makes it so the camera goes up, because obviously you press control up to do that. So that's, that's an example of how you can make it do multiple things. So everything around this outside here you can just do via MacroWorks. Uh, the levers and so forth you have to do in the script, you can't do that via MacroWorks. Okay, so that's kind of how you do the programming of these buttons, it's really simple, just one more time, double click on a button, make sure automatic separation is on, press a key, press another key, it, it's it's pretty much going to uh, keep adding into there, and you can make it so that the press event and the release event do different things. So you may want the uh, uh, it to do um, only do something when you press it, or only do something when you release it. TS guy, is it possible to configure your controls when using a keyboard? I don't know quite how what you mean by that. Um, so essentially, what happens is in a lot of cases, these buttons down here, all they are doing is pressing keys. Yeah, you can make them do other things as well. Actually, if you double click, you've got uh, text is for good for pasting text, keystrokes for doing keys, shortcut will actually so you could use you could actually map the buttons on the rail driver so that they fire applications up. As, so they're not even just used for in-game. You can make them uh, fire up web browser URLs, fire up train simulator itself, or so forth. So you've got all of that. And then in functions, you've got this big list of functions down here where you can uh, you can map all sorts of other things. Um, so virtual keys and uh, multimedia functionality. There's, so there's quite an advanced capability. You can maybe starting and stopping your music and doing all sorts of things. So you've got quite a lot you can map these to. Don't think about it as being limited to just um, Train Simulator. Um, okay, so I think that's pretty much covered that. I hope that makes sense. Um, next up then is the um, the overlays. So you can do that. Uh, by just downloading the overlay from their website, from Raildriver's website, the uh, the URL is uh, raildriver.com slash support slash manuals dot php <laughs> apparently even though I'm streaming I have no internet connection go on That's it. So down here you'll see Rail Driver Legends. Because, you know, we're all Rail Driver Legends. Uh, so if you click to download one of these, and then you can. Uh, so if you could download the PDF and edit it or a doc file. I'm going to do the doc file. So let's open that. And then we can, uh, we can bring that up into Word. There. So TS Guy says, I mean, can you change the key controls? Change the address from Q to insert? Yes, you can. Um, let me just show you how you do that. That's a good example. So AWS is the alert button, which is this one. So if we double click that, you'll see it currently does Q. And if I was to delete on both of those uh, and then go back up to this one, the automatic separation is there. If I just press insert, that's it, job done. That's now going to press insert when I uh, when I press the alert button. Um, so you can you've pretty much got freedom to map any any of these buttons to any key you like. It it really is dead easy. So this is your legends and there is a blank one on the other on the second page here so let's enable editing um, and then if we go down here you can say that you know this is the esc and this is uh, let me 
zoom in a bit so you can see it. Not quite sure why it's not rendering correctly on my system. It renders fine when you print it. Um, and you can put uh, whatever you like in um, in here. And then you, what you do is you print it out. Um, Oh, TS Guy says, can you do that if you don't have a rail driver? Uh, no, uh, you can't remap the functionality um, of the keys and so forth. Right, Ariel Mitz says, why would you want to change the AWS from Q on the rail driver? I don't know, um, but if someone says they want to, then I, I have to assume they have a reason for that. So, um, you can do. Okay, so... These are the templates. Print them out, cut them out, and then let me just bring up the uh, the camera again. Um, and then here, you uh, very gently. It's quite easy to do. You pull this off, and then what you end up with is these bits of paper. Uh, if I can aim them correctly, there you go. Look, escape, quick save control gauges. So you can just get these bits of paper and you just rest them on the right in the right roughly the right place. And then you put the uh, the uh, the cover back on. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. Except when I'm doing it apparently. There we go. Just clip that all back in, make sure we're all we're all back together again. So that's um that's the uh that's the labels. Dead easy to do. It's well worth doing if you've changed any of the mapping functions. Otherwise, you'll be forever confused about what uh, what each thing, each of the things does um, that you've set up. Uh, or you, what you'll do is you'll sometimes, like I do, is you'll f you just won't use the functionality. <laughs> uh, Bioxide. How do you change the manette for the power? I don't quite understand the question for that one. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention last time, by the way, is that there's an another function on the rail driver. Let me just show you what's underneath the rail driver. This. You see these holes. This is a subwoofer. This is quite a, a solid, heavy bit of kit. And it's um, one of the reasons for that is because it's got a subwoofer built into it. Now, if you have... Um, um, if you plug it into the mains, so you don't need to plug it into the mains unless you want the subwoofer. And you just need to plug in the USB. If you do want the main, the the subwoofer, and I'll tell you why you want the subwoofer in a minute. You plug it into the mains. You then it comes with a with a with a sound cord. You plug the sound cord into the laptop or your PC uh, where you would normally plug your headphones, and then you plug your headphones into the rail driver or your speaker system into the rail driver. So you, all the audio is routed through the rail driver. Um, and what happens then is the subwoofer is not there for audio. The subwoofer is there because it shakes the rail driver about. Um, it's a very subtle effect, but it's really nice. So you'll be sitting there with, say, a diesel locomotive or something, and you'll crank up the power, um, and then you'll hear the, uh, the, the the rumbling of the engine. The rail driver will shake a little bit because of that rumbling, which is very, very good. Um, and I can definitely recommend doing it. It was a, It's a really, really neat add. Uh, it gets you that a little bit of force feedback type, uh, and enough force feedback, to be honest. Um, and it's basically, it's entirely dependent on the audio of the uh, of the loco, which is an absolutely brilliant feature. Right, so, where are we up to? So I think we've done all the easy stuff now. So we did uh, coping with trainsim being installed different location, remapping the blue keys, hope that made sense, and printing out the new template, and also how you set the audio up. So get, once again, you've got a green, you've got a cable that comes out, an audio cable that comes out of the rail driver, you plug that into your sound card. You then take your headphones or your speakers and plug them into the rail driver so that it's in uh, a loop. BK Gaming MC, thank you for the follow, much appreciated. Um, just trying to think if I've missed anything off. I don't think I've missed anything off so far. Other than that, you don't have to do anything fancy for the uh, for the uh, subwoofer. If it's there, it works. Okay, this is where it starts getting a bit leery. So. I'm going to switch off the console camera for the moment. This is uh, MacroWorks again. Now, you may choose to do your code editing uh, in Notepad, or you may choose to do it in the uh, script code editor here on the window menu. I'm going to do it in here. It's not the best editing environment, but it is convenient. So let's do that. 
Um, so let's just... Um, actually, I can't make that bigger. Let's not do that. Let's put that over to one side, because we're going to need that in a minute. Uh, and I'm going to uh, bring up Explorer, and we're going to edit the file. Because if I do it in here, I can zoom it so that it's a bit bigger, and it's not tiny little. Uh, it's not tiny little code. Right. What we want to do now is to remap. You've, if you've watched me using the uh, using, you see that when I operate the throttle, this loco brake lever, it operates the. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm whacking the, the a lever, and I'm, I'm not, you can't see um, this one, the loco brake lever. Yeah, this is the normal throttle lever, this one. Um, I'm using the loco brake lever. Now, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, the, this makes more sense, perhaps, for American locos. This is perfect for most electric multiple units and so forth. So, what we're going to do is uh, remap it. Now, it's actually reasonably straightforward, but it's not a really. It, this is not a nice way of doing it. I'm going to stress that. If you're a coder, you're probably going to be a little upset with what I'm about to show. But... Um, <laughs> It's uh, without rewriting the script. There's not actually any easy way of doing it. So I'm going to re-scroll down all this stuff here. There's nothing particularly useful here. And then eventually we get to a section which says Case 2001 Reverser, and then a little bit below that, Case 2002 Throttle. Ah, now that seems like what we're doing. So essentially, what this is is every time you move the throttle, this is the bit of code that gets executed. So I want to basically change that. So let's have another look down. What we see, what the other levers are. 3 is the train brake, and 2004 is the independent or locomotive brakes. 2004 is the lever we're going to be moving. So we're going to change 2002 to 2004. And just add a little comment there. So what happens now is whenever I move the loco brake, this bit of code is going to get executed. But that's not all we need to do. That's not quite going to work. What I now need to do is, you'll see that it talks about lever 1. Now lever 1 is the throttle lever, lever 3 is the loco brake lever. So what I need to do is pull all of this, get this section of code here, until we get to the next case and mark it. And then I'm going to press Control H, and I'm going to change lever 1 to lever 3. In selection means it will only do the change inside the selection I've done, and I'm going to hit replace all. That's it. 44 things were replaced, and that's all of this lot in here. So everywhere now says lever 3 everywhere. So we're almost there. That was uh, uh, change 2 of 3 that we need to do. Now, once we get into the code, we then need to work out what actually happens. And the, the key bit that happens is this bit here. We can ignore the stuff that happens down there for this for this controller. Um, essentially, it does a bit of maths to work out what the minimum and maximum values are. And then if you're beyond what it considers the maximum, it just sends the max. And if you're below the minimum, it sends the minimum. And anywhere in the middle, it sends a value. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Now, remember, the throttle lever is the wrong way around to the loco brake. So the, um, um, the loco brake, you move towards you. Whereas the loco brake, you move away from you, which means min, max, and the wrong way round. So let's just switch those around so that that is min, and that is max. So that will swap those two around. Um, that means when I push the lever all the way forward, it will actually push it up. And then this one is actually fine. This will, this will work correctly. The only other change we need to make then is this position stuff here. So this is, if you just look at the numbers, 3030, 3232, this should be 3131. Okay, so now if I save that and then reopen the script editor and hit build, why you no do nothing? <laughs> Well, you know, do nothing. Hang on, folks. Not in there. It's supposed to say build successful down here. I don't know why it isn't doing that. Let me make it completely unsuccessful. Ah, put something it doesn't like and it complains. And now I put something I do like in. Ah, build succeeded. Good. So if I start the game now. Um, the rail, the the loco brake is now going to do the job. 
Shall we start the game and, f and, and prove me wrong? Well, let's do that, shall we? Let me switch back to changing route for a minute while I get the game running into a uh, into a loco, and then we'll have a look. Utex says, hey, is it? It is Control H. So Control H is replace. Where Control F is find, Control H is find and replace, uh, and that's in uh, in most places. Uh, in most editors, you've got that feature. Right, so the game is just loading now. Um, let me fire up a simple loco just to prove the point. So, back to the normal game screen at this point, and uh, let's change up to that. So we're in the rail drop in here. Let's put the brakes on. It's not doing anything. Still using the old control. Why are you... In <laughs> um... Right, so we've got the game running, and that's clearly not worked. <laughs> it worked, Griff, oh, what have I done wrong? Um, so let me switch back to, if I switch back to desktop, then at least what I'm doing is uh, visible to you as well. I'll do these changes on the, uh, on here. So 2004, oh, that is 2004. That's because the changes I've made haven't gone anywhere. Oh, that's marginally annoying. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take my change that I've made, copy and paste it. There's probably an easy way of doing this. This is the problem with doing things live on a stream. I'm just going to take that and paste it straight over the top of that case statement. All the way down to the end select here. Paste. Build. Succeeded. Now the loco break is working correctly. Okay. So that kind of proves that the uh, the loco break can be remapped if you want to. It's actually quite straightforward. And what I might do is um, put a thing on the blog just detailing some of these scripty changes. So that's the first um, script change I just wanted to uh, to show. Because people have asked me, how do you make the loco break work? with the throttle and there you go that's how you make the local brake work is the throttle so the next two I'll kind of do at once can you see the rail driver ah yes you can't see the rail driver there you go I could have been pretending couldn't I let me just move the camera so you can see the camera a bit more substantially so uh, if I move the camera here so you can see it you can see me moving can't see the throttle <laughs> There you go. So hopefully that makes sense and you can see that it's uh, it's working on the uh, on the loco brake. Okay, we've got one more topic that I want to cover, and what I'm going to do is merge the next two because the next one's about adding notches, um, and I'm going to do that actually on the 150. Um, and, uh, and then you can see it all in, in action. Right, because I'm aware this is uh, kind of uh, over the top and uh, not of great interest to a lot of the people watching. Um, but I guess kind of what I wanted to try and get across to people is just how flexible the rail driver is now. Um, there's, uh, think of the rail driver as a piece of hardware that sort of it can do a lot more than it can right now the box. There's a lot more that it will be able to do as more people... Uh, as more people play with it. Right, so we've got one more thing to do then. Let's switch back to the uh, menus, uh, the menu on the... Uh, actually, no, I'm just going to turn the audio off on the game. There you go. <laughs> um, and we will switch back to the desktop. So, I'll exit the game. Right, so the next thing we're going to do 
is we're going to have a look at the uh, the 150. So the 150 has got a number of uh, interesting behaviors and one of those is that a lot of the controls need precise notch positions for it to actually work. Uh, Scotty, is there a way to increase the sample rate to, the, to increase position? No, unfortunately. Um, that is, uh, that's a limitation of the hardware. Right, so you've got a uh, got the 150. The two controls we're going to have a look at are the train brake and the um, the reverser. Brain's not working. Um, for the train brake and the reverser, we are going to look at. I'm just trying to work out how I'm going to do this. So let's have a look at the first. We'll do the reverser. So why don't I show you the problem first? And that means I need to get the game running again. <laughs> No danger of me being organised, is there? Right, hang on a second, folks. Get the game running again, and then we'll uh, we'll see. Game's nearly there. Okay, so let me fire up the 150, and then we can uh, you can see what what our challenge is with the 150. Right, slowing the game now. So let me get the game switched over so you can see. Um, so ignoring the actual loco itself, well, let's look at the controls on the HUD so we can see what's going on. Um, we'll go in the cab. So let's look at this reverser over here. If I operate the reverser, actually I should put the key in first. Right, let's try it now. So it's kind of awkwardly moving around and it relies on me getting to exactly s particular numbers so you can see I've actually gone so I've gone past there you go look I've actually gone past zero and it's not gone to neutral because it didn't get to zero now it seems like rather finicky but you know what the number of times that that's actually happened while I was driving and what you actually want is for it to just do notching so that it doesn't do that. As another example, if we have a look at the brake here, so you can see this gauge here, uh, and then you can see the train brake. So the train brake is released. Now as I move it forward, you will notice not a bean is happening on that train brake. Nothing whatsoever. Yet when I operate it with the keyboard, it moves. Why is that? It moved back to zero because it reread the uh, train brake again. So you see, nothing is happening, and it's because in order to to get it to work. So if I move it notch up, you see it goes to 100%. Right. Let me see if I can get this to 100%. I can't. Yeah, so it's already moving it, and I can't get it to 100%. And unless I get it the way this loco has been scripted, unless I get it to exactly 100%, it will do absolutely nothing. Um, so let's fix the reverser and fix the loco, uh, the train brake uh, by putting notches onto them, uh, and then you will uh, you'll get the idea. Okay, so let's have a look uh, back on the desktop, um, and we will bring back the uh, macro works. And I'm just going to do the script editing in here. To be honest, there's not actually an awful lot to do, fortunately. So for the reverser. Uh, what we're going to do is find the reverser, which is here. 2001 uh, is the reverser. And ignore a lot of this, you didn't ignore. It's all setting up and it's doing lots of magic. This is the interesting bit, because this is the bit that says, are we on full reverser, full, f sorry, full reverse, full forward? Are we somewhere between reverse and neutral? Are we somewhere between neutral and forward? Uh, or are we in neutral? What we can do is we can actually do something different here. Now, it would be really useful if it only did this for the class 150. 
we can do that because the script has access to the name of the loco that's currently running so let me just paste this little snippet in and then I'll explain what it does uh, so it's saying create a string called temp loco it's a variable, a placeholder, a box if you will and then in here we're going to say get loco name and put it in there and then it says does this string instra says does it contain class 150-2 and if it does we'll do something, if it doesn't we'll do something else so in here I'm going to say else and then I'm going to move all of that over uh, and then I'm going to uh, put an end in there so in here I can now put fancy code I can now do extra stuff so the reverser is going to be set up like this I'll explain the code in a moment this is quite actually quite straightforward it basically is getting rid of all of the um, the variability That's <laughs> slightly strange how it's tabbing it probably because of uh, how I had it uh, pasted away in the background yes is in in the true beta style this is definitely one that I had uh, I made earlier uh, I will explain this in just a minute you'll notice that it's very very similar even just looking at the pattern it's almost identical all I have changed is these two send vowels have been changed to zero so if we're either fully forwards fully backwards or neutral uh, uh, and everything else sends a zero which is neutral um, the only other change I've made is that I've also added an extra buffer so that max reverse as uh, minus 20 or min reverse of plus 20 which essentially means that you can have the maximum plus back a little bit will mean forwards I'll, I'll show you how that works in a minute so if we hit build build failed so I've, I've mismatched something here I probably I put end instead of end if see my, my visual basic is atrocious it's been a long time since I've done visual basic um, and then put that in there so it's a nice thing it does build if you do get any errors it does tell you what's going on so having done that it's now running live now if I move the reverser, let me switch it back you can see it will always hit those sections completely accurately yeah because it's and you'll notice it's not swinging either so if I put the if you watch the HUD there it's only ever going to 0 minus 100 or plus 100 alright let me just show you the code one more time just so I can explain again how that works uh, GeForce, how did you get to the 150 in script editor? I'm not doing anything particular to get to the 150, I am just editing the global script. So in Macroworks, um, where is it? Where have you gone? Which is probably behind here. There it is. There it is. In here, you go window, let me close this down, you go window and then script code. And that's it. There is only one script for every loco. Uh, sorry, one script for the whole system. DTG Steve, does it go to the off position? It doesn't, but you could script it to do that as well. Um, I normally don't because generally you don't need that functionality, but you certainly could script it to do that. Um, let me switch it so the reverser. So you'll notice in here, actually, no. The way this one's been set up, that actually adding it in is going to be a bit more tricky. So let's not worry about it for here. But if I do the notch on the uh, on the break. Um, Oh, you couldn't see the uh, the cat the rail driver. Okay, let me turn the rail driver on. Apologies. Let me switch it back to that and turn the rail driver back on and zoom it back up. Right. So if you look at the blue icon as I move the uh, this backwards and forwards. Yeah, and you can see it's reacting uh, in a digital fashion, essentially. Stabby TV, I'm going to be doing a route actually very shortly. We're, we're just coming to the end of this now. I've got one more bit to do, uh, and then we'll be uh, getting on with the uh, the next route, which is London Faversham. So let me put that back where it was, uh, and go back to the uh, the next bit. So let's go back to the desktop and bring up Macroworks one more time. So the next thing we're going to have a look at is the um, train break so the train brake on the uh, that's this one 2003 is the train or auto brake 
Um, the train brake on the 150 requires very precise positioning. So what we're going to do is uh, have a look here. And again, we've got a lot of very similar setup. Once you get used to the way this works, it's actually very similar. And again, this is where the, the sort of the, the really the, the useful bit of the script is. And we're just going to change it again. So we're going to make it so that it only does it if it's on the 150 by putting in our um, our bit of code. So it's the same bit of code we put in before, uh, and then we need to put an else, uh, and then down here uh, we need to put uh, an end if. We'll try and get it right this time. And then what well, this is just leaving it back the way that it was. Uh, and then what we're going to do is up here we're going to paste this bit of code in. I'll like, walk you through it in just a moment. Uh, let me just get this in. Oh, lovely, joyous text editing. I'm going to put the... I'm not expecting you to read the code off of this window, I should stress. Uh, I really am not. It's um, That would be silly. Um, and... I'm going to put the minimum... Actually, I don't need the minimum max. Right, so essentially what I'm doing here is saying is if it's the 150... Then calculate the value, which will be between the appropriate braking value, which will be between on this loco, it's between zero and four. And then what I'm going to do is work out, turn it from being a, a buying a floating value from zero to zero point one, zero point two to one, etc., and turn it into an absolute zero. So anything between zero and one becomes zero. Anything between one and two becomes one, and so forth up to four. So if we now build that, build succeeded first time. Check that out. If I now uh, unlock the camera and go and have a look at the uh, the braking system, and we do that in the live game so you can see the camera as well. Uh, that one. That's the one I want. Let me zoom the camera up a little bit. Right, now if I start operating the uh, this brake, you notice how it's, it's not moving in a... Um, uh, a completely fluid fashion anymore. It's moving in a very, very much a notched fashion now. And you'll also notice the brakes are working. So this has fixed the problem with the 150 and its brakes. Now the script already copes with the throttle lever. So the throttle lever works, the reverser works, the brakes work. Fundamentally the train works. There's more you can do if you mess with the script, but that's essentially got you the core functionality on this particular loco working. And this is one of the harder ones to get working actually. Um, most locos do work without any modification. I just want to stress that actually. Most locos do not need modification. The way that the PI engineering script works, you do not need to do any modifications. But um, if you find one like this where this brake lever didn't work properly, this is generally why. Generally it's because they need the values of the controller set to be specific values. They can't be floating values in, in order for them to actually uh, to work correctly. Okay? So I hope that's been useful. Um, I know it's been very technical, um, and uh, it's uh, it's all it is. This video is going to get uploaded to YouTube um, at some point. Uh, maybe not tonight, but certainly tomorrow, if not tonight. And um, then you can go through it again. And what I will probably do is write a train sim live dot blogspot dot co uk article which goes through the coding a little bit more step by step so you can actually see the code. I know you can't really see it very easily on the stream. Um, so you'll be able to see see the actual segments. But hopefully if you were to look at the code and you were to look at that, watch me uh, doing it on the stream, you can see what's there. But I guess more importantly, what I wanted to find out, what I wanted to show you was how much flexibility you get with this updated version, with the updated code from Train Simulator and the updated version of MacroWorks so that you can actually operate all that functionality. Um, there's a lot more it could do, um, but it would require more more work to actually uh, to sort that out. So. I hope that's been useful and you'll be able to get the most out of your uh, your rail driver. Um, let me zoom back out. That's better. Uh, right, uh, and with that, I think it is time to uh, to move along. 
So let me move that back onto uh, changing route, uh, and I'm going to just sort this all out now. <laughs> Put my system back the way I like it. 